Welcome to the Exponentially Me podcast. Have you ever wondered if we can work better, if we get along better, and if leaders can really influence that? In this podcast, these are some of the questions we will be answering. We'll be talking to some amazing people from all around the world, not just thinkers on this, but the doers, giving you practical information that can make you a better colleague and even a better leader. My name is Ixon Naval, and I was wondering, do you believe, like Woodrow Wilson, that the first great cause of leadership is to have a cause? Now, I believe it is purpose. What do you think? Today, I'm speaking with Professor Percy Huygens. Now, I know Percy from the time that I did my MBA at the Rotterdam School of Management, Percy is Professor of Organizational Theory, Development and Change. He's also Scientific Director at ERIM and the Dean of Research. He's also the Chair for Family Business and has recently been recognized as one of the top five most published and engaged economists of the Netherlands. Now, he's been published all over, and he's got an illustrious career as an academic. But I like the way that he thinks, and he pushes different perspectives to make you think about what you're actually saying and doing. I think the key word for our discussion was identity. We begin by talking about how people use disposable income in the third world. We then move on to conscious consumption and how people use craft beer as a statement. One thing we spent a lot of time on in discussion was the relationship between brand and consumer, and is that a reciprocal relationship? We then close by talking about Dolly Parton and country music and how songs like Coat of Many Colors shows the importance of identity. Welcome to the podcast, Percy. Thank you, uh, Eckstein. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, we had talked a little bit about it, um, what we've been talk about before. But what I find fascinating is when we were together at the RSM, when I was doing my MBA there, your view on how people work together, sort of from a strategic perspective, I thought was really fascinating. And then the work that you've done um, with entrepreneurs and with um, craft work, I just thought was an interesting sort of perspective. But so I'm going to ask you, when you think about leadership and relationships, what does that bring to mind for you? Well, the first thing that I thought when you said that you want to talk about those topics in particular was that I completely freaked out, uh, Extend, because I usually study companies, right? I mean, I study a lot of family businesses, I study a lot of state-owned enterprises, but uh, uh, but actual uh, down-home nitty-gritty leadership and uh, the more interpersonal and networky stuff, uh, uh, in all honesty, usually is my uh, my cup of tea. Uh, but uh, uh, luckily, or at least luckily, I think one of the things that did came to mind is that indeed I have been studying uh, uh, quite a bit about how craftspeople relate to their work uh, uh, and the meaning and the intrinsic motivation that they find in there. Uh, uh, and as a kind of a, a number of side projects, I've been studying a lot of entrepreneurs and especially also necessity entrepreneurs, right? So people on the fringes of society. Uh, uh, who then design their ventures, but where those ventures also give back to them in kind of like uh, a self-leadership, self-piloting fashion. So I thought, well, maybe we can use those at least as starting points for our conversation today. I think it's a great place to start. I mean, um, growing up in South Africa and having worked with people in the townships, that, that those people at the fringes of society, as we as you just mentioned, people that, that have to, out of necessity, innovate and sometimes innovate just to be able to put food on the table. Um, I think it's fascinating and, and, and our ingenuity of the human being comes out in, in situations of duress and stress. So, um, but tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me more about these entrepreneurs and these craft workers. Yeah, so starting with the entrepreneurs, right? Because you uh, you mention uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the townships in South Africa, uh, the context in which uh, I, together with uh, especially one of my my brilliant PhD students, uh, and I need to give a shout out to him, uh, uh, Musa, uh, uh, a great uh, PhD student. But the context in which we uh, have primarily studied necessity entrepreneurs is in the uh, Rohingya refugee camps. 
so people that have fled from Myanmar and now find themselves in the Kutupalong district in uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and these are literally people on the fringe, right? So they are uh, uh, people who have been completely dislocated, uprooted, uh, 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 are now essentially being put in uh, in camps that, that uh, yeah, hold the middle between, let's say, a, uh, a prison and a, uh, and, and, a, and a thoroughfare, so to speak. Uh, and the question that we have asked ourselves there is, is what do these people do to uh, to give meaning and to add, add additional layers of, of purpose to their lives, so to speak, even though all the, the, the cards are stacked against them? Uh, uh, another thing that you mentioned, uh, and we can talk about that a little bit more in just uh, in just a minute, is the, the, the idea of putting food on the table, uh, which is interesting because we also... Uh, uh, entered the, the field with that particular question in mind, right? I mean, do people indeed go through necessity entrepreneurship or do they use necessity entrepreneurship to put food on the table or do they also do it to uh, uh, to get other stuff done? To, for example, to embellish and enrich their, their, their identities, but also their social relationships. Uh, and what is super interesting, I think, as, as one of our findings is that, that people, after they have covered the very, very bare necessities of life uh, already uh, uh, very quickly begin to turn to use the, the, the proceeds of their entrepreneurship uh, uh, to better their social relationships and their social capital rather than their, uh, their, their, their immediate uh, personal well-being, so to speak. I think that's very interesting because um, what I saw in South Africa in, I mean, I grew up close to Gaborone and um, I the first part of what I remember from that time is in the middle 80s, or actually early 80s, is we were going through the middle of the drought. And there was the, the farmers would barely make, make ends meet, and cash flow was a really big issue. And so farmers were at the point of just trying to keep themselves and the, and, and the workers alive and, and just putting food on the table. But when the chips were down, People go like, you know what, um, I just got a delivery of diesel. I'll lend you some diesel so you can pay me back. Um, here's a tractor. Why don't I give you my tractor and my tech tractor driver to help out on your farm? And then your farm workers come and help me out again. So to make sure that everybody gets paid and at the same time the farmer could, could keep his cash flow under control, um, those kind of things happen, which is unusual. You know, you don't have it's, – it's not separate enterprises. All of a sudden the whole community worked together. And I saw that happening in Kofikral, which is one of the townships close to there as well. Um, and in Alexandra more recently, that, that when, when the chips are down, people really get stuck in together. And it's, it, it, especially the women, strangely enough, it, it, was, it was quite a beautiful thing to see. I don't know what your experience has been with that. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, just one uh, small caveat is that the, the Rohingya community is a, uh, is a very uh, devout but also very orthodox Muslim community. So when we talk about entrepreneurs, there is a, uh, uh, a very strict separation, I would say, between the types of entrepreneurial activities men can do, and, and those are mostly the entrepreneurs in that community. Uh, versus the, the the entrepreneurial activities that women can do. I mean, women are entrepreneurs also in uh, in those settings, uh, 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 but they tend to practice more of the household crafts, such as, for example, in-house tailoring, uh, uh, the stuff that we would typically relate more to in terms of entrepreneurship and trade are the things that uh, has so the the stuff that, uh, that 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 meets the daylight and the stuff that actually uh, proceeds in the bazaars and on the streets. That is the kind of stuff that uh, that that men do in that particular community. Um, but it, one thing that you said is that uh, uh, is that it, it struck you as being uh, it struck you as unusual that people uh, start investing in social relationship and essentially what you say in cohesion and solidarity already, uh, uh, even when they uh, uh, themselves are in the uh, on, on the fringe or on the, on the verge of collapsing. Um, I think that, that 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 one of the things that studying necessity entrepreneurship does is that it it. it, it it encourages us to rethink what is usual and what is unusual about the human condition, right? And so what, what we find is that uh, uh, as soon as people have a, the tiniest bit of discretion over where they spend their money or where they spend their proceeds, right? So if they're uh, at least they're, uh, they're, they're, they're themselves and their kids are fed for the day, then what are you going to do with the additional dollar uh, that you make? 
Uh, and one of the things that we found is, is that people indeed tend to uh, uh, spend this money on things such as uh, uh, bringing uh, uh, wedding gifts to the wedding of their, uh, their neighbor to uh, 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 represent themselves a little bit better, buy somewhat more decent clothes so that they come across as uh, individuals that are slightly better uh, well-to-do, but indeed also the types of, uh, of, of social bonds, social capital building. Uh, uh, exchanges that uh, that you refer to, and I think that especially when we look at entrepreneurs on the uh, on on the fringe in that sense, it also becomes obvious that that these are not uh, uh, frivolous things to do, uh, but that it is at the core of, of what what humans do that 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 building relationships and and giving yourself a position in society uh, is one of the most fundamental things that that people have to do uh, in order to get by in life. I think that's also interesting because for. I recently had the opportunity to listen to something that Kelly McGonigal was saying. She's a um, professor at Stanford. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she, she specifically looks at stress. And she says that one of the things people can best do is when you're under a position, in a position of stress or duress, is to reach out and do something nice to someone else. And the moment you do that, it's one of the coping mechanisms we have. And so I'm wondering to what extent that also plays a role in, because we've seen this across different cultures. I mean, if you say the Rohingyas are doing this, that's mainly a Muslim culture. Where I grew up was mainly a Protestant Christian culture. And when we look at, at, at African culture, it's more tribal and ancestral worship. So it's completely different religions, but yet very human. Yeah, we. Uh, I think we agreed that we were not going to talk about your four trackers past, right, uh, extent. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, uh, I, so th- th- an interesting question is what type of theoretical frame do you put on this, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a scientist and I have to, to think about how this uh, this relates to a uh, wider and broader uh, framework, so to speak. Uh, and the lens that just seems to fit, certainly in, in this case, is also the uh, uh, the lens of, of, of personal identity, right? And personal identity is never singular. It is plural. It also is, has a very strong social component, right? I mean, identity has to be granted to you. It has to be uh, uh, gifted to you also by others who recognize and validate that identity. Uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, entrepreneurship is next to a, a means of putting food on the table. It is also an identity project that allows you to uh, uh, to live a fuller life and to uh, uh, to also re- yeah to to find certain parts of yourself recognized by others, such that you are more comfortable with it, so to speak. Uh, and so, in terms of of entrepreneurship also being a coping mechanism, right? If that is what you uh, you said, well, coping may not be the word, but at least it is a mechanism to, to find a place in the world uh, and to see uh, uh, some, of you, some parts of yourself reflected in structures that are uh, uh, bigger and more universal than you yourself as a person are. And I think, I guess that that, that is one of the, the, the powerful aspects of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurship, that it is also an, an identity expression tool uh, and so that is kind of like the, the theoretical spin, if you wish, that I would like to put on uh, on, on, on those kinds of experiences. Isn't that uh, maybe a good segue to craft work? That sense of identity. Is that something you noticed in craft work as well? Yeah, very much so. And and, and look, I, I'm not uh, uh, the, I, I'm not necessarily the carpenter who only has a hammer and wants to to put an identity ring on everything, right? I mean, if you don't like my principles or my theories, I've got others, uh, Extain. But uh, uh, but clearly, I mean, a, a craft work is, is is something very different, right? And if you uh, look at what I did in terms of uh, uh, craft work, then uh, there's two communities or three communities that I uh, that I've studied pretty long and in-depth. Uh, uh, two of them are, are, are craft beer brewers, uh, one in Canada, mostly in Quebec. Uh, uh, and I've studied a whole lot of craft beer brewers in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, uh, so those are two strong craft communities. Uh, in a more uh, recent study, uh, uh, I've uh, begun to study songwriters, uh, uh, mostly in the Nashville area. So people who uh, uh, have the, the, the most uh, prolific and most uh, uh, economically precious uh, or valuable music ecosystem in the world is in Nashville. Uh, and it's a tremendous community of songwriters who uh, we tend to associate it with country, but in fact, uh, uh, they, they write about all genres or for all genres. Uh, but those are three communities of craft workers that I have, uh, that I have studied uh, quite intensively and, and indeed uh, at all levels, uh, uh, craft work is also identity work. 
Can you give us more of an example? If you are an entrepreneur in the microbrewery sector, right, and uh, uh, some of these really are, are, are home craft exercises or home craft uh, uh, elements, but, but we've got a couple of hundred beer brewers in the Netherlands that have a, a pretty decent professional outfit, right, where if you walk on, on the premises, you see that here's someone trying to make a living. Um, uh, what is interesting is that uh, 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 beer, of course, is a consumption good, uh, 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 but in the craft beer brewing, it's never for binge drinking, right? It's never the case that people just uh, 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 drink craft beer just to get, get completely hammered or wasted, right? It's not collegiate beer or it's not, uh, uh, it's not your run-of-the-mill Heineken. So uh, uh, it is always uh, uh, beer that is meant for what uh, uh, the famous French sociologist Bourdieu would call conspicuous consumption. Right. I mean, so uh, by uh, uh, drinking a specific craft beer, you also uh, you, you show a little bit of yourself one sip at a time, so to speak. Uh, uh, but that is only true because, on the other hand, there is a person who cognizantly and, and with all their faculties and, and with all the love and admiration is trying to brew or build a product, including an image, including uh, a brewery premises, uh, uh, including the label, uh, 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 including the uh, uh, the tacitness of the brewery in which it is produced, uh, which lends itself to that product becoming a cultural product, right? A product whereby consuming it, you show and express part of your own identity, so to speak. Uh, and so what is really fascinating to see is that if you follow breweries from essentially the initiation of the idea until uh, the time that they have their uh, their first beer on the shelf, so to speak, and and, and by the time they have established some some strong distribution relationship and some some relationship with some uh, some bars or pubs that are willing to to serve their uh, uh, their products. Uh, that entire uh, trajectory is a trajectory where the identity of the founder, but also interestingly, identity elements of the immediate surroundings of the community and of the uh, the, the context in which that beer is uh, is brewing. I know it's beginning to start super metaphysical here, but it really isn't meant to be that way. Uh, but but all those elements of identity find a way into into those beers as a product. So the the uh, uh, over time, layer upon layer, uh, uh, craft beer breweries as organizations and beers as products be, be become embellished with increasingly interesting uh, layers of, of identity. And so in that sense, uh, just for the, the beer example, uh, uh, I think that, the, the, again, the identity lens, and uh, again, then especially the, the identity expression lens is a really good way of framing what is going on. So if I understand correctly, if you, the identity of both the brewer infuses, the, or the craft beer brewer infuses the brand, but does it also mean to a certain extent the identity of the consumers infuse that? Uh, in a reciprocal way, yes, right? I mean, uh, uh, as a, uh, a consumer, you make a choice. I mean, and if you uh, live in the Netherlands or if you live in any of the uh, the mature beer markets uh, uh, in this day and age, not sure whether South Africa counts as one of them, Extend, but let's not go there. But if you... Uh, 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 if you live in Denmark, if you live in the Netherlands, if you live in the US, if you live in Canada, you literally have a choice of hundreds of beers to drink. And, and the beer that you pick up says something about yourself, right? And it says something of the uh, 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 of the community that you're part of. I, I don't hope that our uh, beloved viewers are now freaking out because they've always unreflectively just picked up the beers that they liked in the supermarket. And now all of a sudden we are alerting to the fact that they are making a profound life choice when they do it next time. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys, it wasn't meant as such. Uh, uh, by all means, keep on drinking what you drink and enjoy it uh, uh, responsibly, though. But, uh, uh, but, but you are right, right? I mean, it's a mutually, uh, and again, this is sounding super, super metaphysical. Uh, and and for, for those of you who are watching it later, we're recording this at nine in the morning. Uh, but it's it's kind of like a mutually constitutive relationship where essentially a, a multitude of brewers gives you with an identity laden choice set and, and where you by uh, 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 picking up certain beers and, 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 and letting go of others uh, also determine uh, which community you want to be a part of. Right. Or, or, or what what side of yourself you want to show by drinking a certain beer. I think yeah, I, I never thought about it, actually, but. In when I grew up in South Africa, or this, when I was in the military, strangely enough, um, there was also a sense of identity around what do you drink. Um, and I grew up in a family where um, my cousins um, make wine, so it's that was a, that was a, again a completely different identity. And growing up in a family itself that didn't consume much alcohol, there was also a different identity. So when I got into the military, it was all of a sudden I've got a lot of choices to make. What choices do I make? 
And what I think is really funny today is that Amstel beer at that time in South Africa was really difficult to get. And now I live in the city that where the name comes from, you know, and it is um, in Amsterdam. And it, here it's just there's, there's nothing considered special about it in the sense that it is just sort of like a run of the mill beer. But in South Africa, it had a status symbol in those days. And so the part of the identity was that you drink Amstel because you're not going to drink the run of the mill stuff, you know. And so I think that is that. It, now we have craft beers to, to sort of have that same in, in mature markets. We have that. But in South Africa, I think that to a large extent, there's still a – the craft beer community is much smaller. Let's put it that way. That sure. I don't think that, that there's, there's the same amount of, um, of these available. What is interesting, though, is talking about alcohol and entrepreneurship. Never thought about that as well, but there was this woman I knew growing up. I think it was in my early teens. And um, she knew my nanny, and she had started um, under the sort of under the table, going to to town and in these informal um, taxis, basically picking up a few crates of beer, and then bringing it out to the community where she was living. And so on a Friday Friday night, especially around month end when everybody got paid, um, she would do a good good trade. And I knew know that when I, just before we left that area, which I, when I was, I was about eighty six, she um, she actually had her whole own beer hall. So she uh, over the space of about six years, she would built up a thriving business in alcohol. And I thought to myself, you know, she was a single mum. You know, she had I think three or four kids to take care of. Um, the dad had absconded and necessity entrepreneurship, you know, what, what do you do? What can you do? What is available to you in the community? And, um, yeah, I never thought about it. You know, the memories uh, you trigger for me, Percy. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. And so we connect the one with the other. No. And, and, and also I guess that for our much beloved viewers, I mean, uh, it, it's obvious that, 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 that 70 or 80% of the people will not. Uh, uh, relate to the the beer story that we just told, right? Because yeah. they've never thought of of their beer consumption as something that they do conspicuously, and that's fully okay. But uh, therefore, I, I uh, when I uh, talk about this in in group settings in class, for example, the, the the exercise that I usually tend to do is that why don't you look at your own uh, uh, private life, right? I mean, and uh, uh, and most of the people whom you find in an MBA class are let's say a little bit above the necessity level so they've got some uh, discretionary income to spend at least before they uh, had to pay their mba tuitions uh, right so uh, and then the the the, the question that, that that i then tend to ask is so look at your own spending behavior and what then is the one category that you uh, just spend a, a a disproportionate amount of money on right where you know that regular people wouldn't spend the money on category x or y but uh, uh, each time you do it, you uh, uh, you do it because it gives you uh, more pleasure than it does to everybody else, right? And so maybe we can make this a, an early morning confession, uh, Eckstein. Uh, I, for example, have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cookbooks, right? I mean, uh, uh, I'm a cook. I, uh, I, 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 I love to chop onions at the end of the day just to get my frustrations of academic life out of the way uh, before I meet my family. But But I have way more cookbooks than I could ever cook from. Uh, and that, of course, is an act of conspicuous or identity-related consumption in and of itself. But now, uh, I don't want to turn the tables on you, but but what would that be for you, uh, Exting? Well, let's call it, if we, if we stick to the disproportionate element of it, yeah. I think there's three things that come to mind. One is our extensive collection of wines, <laughs> so, um, but that we built up over years. Um, so you have to have that consistent effort that you put into it. Um, the other thing is art, um, and then gaming. I'm also an online gamer in between everything else. So uh, I'm, sure, I'm, that, sure that glad I I'm sure glad I learned the first two things about you. Uh, I, I can so totally <laughs> not relate to online gaming, but wine and art. Well, I mean, if you want to have textbook examples of conspicuous consumption, there you have them, right? Uh, up to a point. Yeah. So, I mean, do you also, I mean... Is it more like a like a secluded personal identity thing for you that you like to uh, 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 enjoy those things uh, 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 with your partner in the privacy of your own home, or do you also uh, enjoy it to I don't know to entertain and to show other people's your collection or to 
to drink the wine together? Is it, is it conspicuous consumption? COVID has not COVID has not been good for us. Well, that's concerned. No, we, we we normally like sharing our experiences. So. For instance, um, one of my favorite wine estates in the world is Schäfer Fröhlich in uh, the Nahe Valley in Germany. And um, it's a very one- young winemaker. And it's the memories of the trip. We went down to the to the Saar and the Mosul and the Rhine and specifically to taste um, Rieslings because I always thought, you know, Rieslings is that stuff that people put antifreeze in from Austria and nobody wants to drink that. Uh, that's Gruner um, Valdliner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what happened is I went to, just a little bit of backtrack, I went to London with, with Alan and um, we had, met up with my cousin Dan and he has, I mean, if you thought I had a wine collection, his is exceptional, you know. And he pulled out a bottle of Riesling, and I went like white wine from the eighties. Um, seriously, you know, it, isn't this a bit over? It's sort of like prime. And he poured it, and I just fell in love. Over the space of forty minutes, it felt like I drank six different wines. Every bit of oxidation created a completely new experience. I thought to myself, this is fantastic. So we basically booked a whole holiday or driving holiday, so we can put some wine in the back of the car all the way down to the to Germany. I mean, all the way down. It sounds like it's really, really far, but I mean, in the Netherlands, these things are not really that far, you know, it's like <laughs> just across the border. <laughs> um, and I researched all the wines beforehand in um, Wine Spectator. I mean, sort of like talking about identity and spending time, not just money. Sure. And um, so looking at different wine magazines, created a short list of 10 wine estates we would like to visit and booked the whole holiday around that and the accommodation around that. And then we got to, to Chef Freilich and he normally does, only sells to, uh, he doesn't sell to the public because I mean, people don't really do that in, in, in Germany, you know, but yeah. we just like to go to the estates. So we, we rocked up there without an appointment and just tried. So, well, you will, you will give it a bash if he's there, he's there, if he isn't, he isn't. I mean, you know, sort of very Dutch thing to do is just try something out, you know, the, I mean, knocked on the door and his wife opened the door and she spoke no word of English. And my German, I can understand a little bit, but I can't seriously speak it. So eventually, through the hand gestures, he came out and um, we started talking to him. And we just both all discovered that we have this intense passion around wine. And um, then he started explaining some of his wines and my husband picked up notes that he had never picked up on the wine. So it became this really sort of passionate discussion. And off the back of that, we decided to order a few cases. Um, and the wine was not even being sold yet. We just said, ship it to us. We, we're just so much in love with it, just ship it to us. And so he shipped the wines. And a few weeks later, we realized he won number one and number two for the best Riesling in Germany for that year. So that story in of itself is something I don't mind sharing because it's something that I really enjoyed. And so when we share the wine, you tend to share the story. And so you create a different kind of identity on one hand, I think, but also a different type of connecting with, with your guests. So when we, when we pour a wine that's, that's a few hundred euros, you, you want to share it with somebody special. And so for us, it's inviting people that enjoy food, enjoy wine and have a sit down. And it, it's the enjoyment of the company and, and, and the, the food that is at the core of it and it's not it's not about the showing off side for me it's more about the shared experience so as you were saying yes that that shared experience so same with Catherine Wood one of my favorite artists her painting hangs in my living room because I like to see it every day yeah and so uh, what is obvious is that the, the connection between uh, identity and narratives are super strong right and so uh, up to a point of course uh, an identity is the life narrative that you uh, 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 tell of and about yourself every day, right? Also through the consumption that you uh, you do. But the story about the, the, the winery and how easy that came to you and how uh, 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 and that, that also says something about your aesthetic and your sensory experiences and how that tells something about you as a person, right? I mean, that, that is kind of like that, that identity co-creation between on the one hand, the winemaker and then your deep love for what he creates. Uh, on the other hand, that is uh, that is a, a very tangible and, and 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 a very recognizable form of identity expression and identity co-creation. And so, and that's 
uh, 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 going back to me being the scientist, I mean, that is part of the stuff that I love to study, right? I mean, it is, it is super interesting that, that obviously this is a for-profit business, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if you want to bring it down to the, to the end of it, then, uh, then he needs to get his 99 points in Wine Spectator and the, 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 the cases will flow, right? And the money will come in and the cash will be secure. But of course, there's so much more to it, right? I mean, uh, the narrative of, uh, uh, of his winery and, and, and a tiny bit your life would not be complete without the telling of that story and the, and the deep experiences behind that. Uh, 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 and that is what makes the nexus of identity and business so special, I think. I think that also means that when we look at things like branding, um, Nike, for instance, or some of these big brands are not really, yes, there's an identity element, but it's not, in my view anyway, it's, it's not as personal. Because when you're an entrepreneur, your whole business is personal. And so the brand, the brand of big, the big brands is a cultured or a created brand and an identity for the consumer, but it's not an identity of those that lead it. And so I'm, I'm wondering to what extent do entrepreneurs and then especially within startups in the first few years, does the identity of the, of the founders really leave a stamp behind and does it create a reciprocal identity formation within the consumer? Well, I, you know what, what, what I would say, uh, you uh, put those as pondering wide ranging questions. I would say that those processes are, are, are almost obviously true, right? Um, uh, what is really uh, interesting, I guess, and, and I've definitely seen it happen in my lifetime, right? Uh, 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 I live in a country where the, the uh, where uh, I was born in 1973. But if you look at at, at what has happened since, uh, and I'm from the Netherlands, but but my country has become impossibly more affluent in that intervening period, right? I mean, uh, 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 since then, all of a sudden, everyone went to college. We 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 turned from a uh, 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 an industrial and, and, and agricultural economy into a service economy, uh, full throttle. Uh, 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 and I would say we, we, we're not Singapore, we aren't filthy rich, but everyone is affluent. Uh, and, that, and that has done some, and we've seen similar processes in Denmark and, and, and in Sweden and, in, uh, 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 and a little bit earlier on in the US. So, and what that has done is that it has had a really profound impact on, on, on business as we know it, right? Um, uh, 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 earlier, uh, uh, before everyone had access to all the products that, that we now take for granted, right? Before everyone had a fridge and before everyone had a phone and before everyone had a, a, a television set, uh, uh, essentially uh, companies got away with just producing, uh, 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 essentially a mass produce uh, products for the masses, so to speak, right? Where economies of scale and, 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 and price value ratios were, were important. Uh, but what we now see, uh, and, and that's latching on to the story that we told earlier, for, for many of the products that you use in your everyday life, I mean, uh, that's fine, right? I mean, uh, many people don't care whether they wear a tailored shirt or whether they have a, uh, a $400 case of Riesling lying uh, from, the, from the Mosul in their, their cellars. Uh, but the point is that everyone has a few of these categories right now, right? We, we live in this in this in this post-industrial world where, where where people already have everything. Also, post-material world where people go for experiences and where people uh, uh, want to enrich their lives with things that matter to them. Uh, and so, what we have seen is that at the fringes of, of almost every industry, new players, entrepreneurial players. Uh, 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 have popped up smaller companies that 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 that, that do manage to, to 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 create a mesh of uh, uh, product value and identity. And so these kind of more personal narratives that we just talked about, right? Uh, 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 and uh, uh, they have been steadily nibbling away at the positions of these industrial giants in pretty much every industry, right? And so you can go, uh, 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 and so the wine market has diffracted. Um, uh, 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 the, the music production industry has diffracted. Uh, uh, if you want to buy a, uh, a pair of tailored shoes or handmade shoes in the Netherlands, now all of a sudden you have a choice of brands again, whereas in the past you really couldn't. Uh, and so uh, it doesn't really matter what your passion is, but everywhere in, in all the niches and interstitches that have opened up, entrepreneurs now can find a real living in a live project because people don't care about uh, uh, value quality ratios that more, but they, they want to have a product and they want to have access to products that 
allow them to effectively tell their life stories, right? I mean, you could get a, a similarly rated case of Weasling on Vivino for uh, 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 for probably 50% of the price and, and it will save you the trip to the to the Mosul area, but you wouldn't have the story, right? And so, uh, and that's precious in, in today's world where uh, essentially all your basic comforts and needs are already cared about. And so big business is under pressure and is under threat uh, and they may not realize it but in many markets these more identity uh, uh, savvy entrepreneurs are nibbling away at, at, at their volume and at their margin the, the flip side for me is also interesting and that is that what is a brand to you as an entrepreneur we we tend to think about oh i have a product but we don't think to think about it i have an identity I think it's interesting to think what is that identity. I mean, that's one of the things I'm going to take from this conversation is um, for a strategy session in January, talking to my people is, yeah. what is how will we put identity front and center in our brand? I think the one word that I think the one word that connects them, and it's a, it's a word that we hear too, that we hear too much of in this day and age. But the 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 the, the real uh, uh, key word here, I think, is authenticity. Right? I mean, so it used to be the case where you thought where well, you can make any brand. Uh, uh, fit uh, or any brand image fit for any product. Uh, it doesn't matter how close or how distant it is to uh, to the product, uh, 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 as long as you have the best possible uh, uh, copywriters and 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 and, and the, the madmen like uh, uh, creatives who uh, uh, who build the nice and cultivate the brand brand image for you. But in uh, markets where identity consumption is front and center. Uh, brands have to be authentic, right? So the the brand cannot be far removed, and 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 if you want to make it really strong, it really has to be intertwined with the identity, not just of the company, but also of the people behind it. Uh, and that is true authenticity, right? Where the 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 brand is just completely interlaced with the identity of the founder, of the brewmaster, uh, uh, of the people who really uh, uh, have their, uh, their their hands on the malt, so to speak. If it's a if it's a beer company, or their uh, uh, or their, uh, their their fingers on the grapes if it's uh, uh, if it's a winery uh, and 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 authenticity simply uh, simply put simply means that, that that identity and brand have to become one. I know this is not your forte. I'm just wondering how far does this then filter down? So, for instance, if we look at family-owned businesses, yeah, is there a family identity involved in that? Yeah, very much so. Uh, more importantly, I mean, uh, 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 one of the things that is that is very obvious for for, for family firms is that um, uh, uh, so one of the things that we have have oftentimes seen is that, is that family firms are quite remarkable, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that they don't do particularly well, right? They're not very formal. They uh, uh, they're not great with formal systems, with quota, with uh, with quality control, and that kind of stuff per se. At least not in a formal sense, but at the same time, they they oftentimes beat similar companies, ref line and center when it comes to their their performance. Right? I mean, uh, 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 family firms really are the uh, 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 the, the the unsung heroes of many uh, uh, parts of the economy. Not everywhere, but in many places, they uh, they are. But if well, there's one thing that, that really shows from from prior research is that uh, uh, they can only do this and they can only uh, meaningfully play that role. Uh, as long as families are really hands-on involved with the ownership and the management of the firm, right? So management firms or, or, or family firms become special when the family uh, projects its values uh, and its sense of purpose. And 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 and, and again, uh, not to to overly use this word, but their identity as a family on the the the, the firm and use it as a vehicle uh, by which they enact it. And so, family firms are are exceptional as long as families are willing and able to bear the, uh, the, the, the additional efforts that, that it costs to day in and day out, uh, put something of yourself in your firm, right? And, and then they do really, really well. The moment they stop and the moment family firms uh, become led by families uh, as passive investors, the magic is gone, right? I mean, then uh, 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 nothing that makes uh, uh, family firms special, uh, and there's a lot of things that do make them special, but nothing that makes them special will then last. So you have to uh, completely and, and perennially infuse the, the, the family firm with your values, with, with your love for the, the things that you do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and otherwise, the, the, the magic will be gone. This makes me wonder, though. We often say you, you join a company, you leave a manager. Yeah. Um, and I remember my time in the military where the corporal we had 
He was not the harshest person in the in in the, in the military unit, but he had a sense of compassion, and in a way, we identified with him. And so we were willing to do stuff for him that nobody else in the company was willing to do for any for any of the other leaders. And so we consistently outperformed the rest of the platoons. And I'm just wondering if leaders shouldn't take a leaf out of that book as well. Understand what their identity is and the impact that it has on those they lead. I think that that is a very profound thought, uh, uh, Stein, but there I'm also scratching the limits of what I know about leadership, which I already told you in the beginning isn't very much. Yeah, no, I do. <laughs> so perhaps I'm we can wondering. bring it to a close yeah. by talking about country music for a little bit, uh, Eckstein. Yes, please, <laughs> tell me about country music. Because, I mean, again, we're talking about identity. Yes, go for it. Yeah, I wish I uh, I thought to put on my uh, my cowboy hat and my boots, of course, uh, for for the interview. But uh, next time, uh, Exting, uh, no, I mean, um, I think that uh, uh, all joking aside, I mean, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, I've had heaps, heaps of fun uh, studying uh, 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 songwriters, right, in the uh, the national ecosystem, which is something that I. Uh, uh, I do with my uh, uh, my much beloved friend and, and co-author uh, Katrine Smolka out of uh, Warwick Business School. Uh, uh, although I have uh, uh, 27 extra years of uh, of listening to country music on her, so to speak, so uh, I consider myself the real expert here. Uh, 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 but let's not uh, let's not go there. Uh, uh, totally unfair to her. Um, but I think that in, in, in continuing with what we. Uh, uh, with what we have seen, uh, what we have talked about today, so to speak, I think that uh, uh, the perfect country song or the perfect country songwriter is someone uh, uh, who makes it her craft uh, uh, to literally take those life experiences that we all go through and to uh, uh, to take the pains and the insecurities and the joys and, uh, uh, well, not so much joy because country songs are supposed to be sad, right? But... Uh, uh, but take all those life experiences and, and craft them literally day in and day out into new songs, right? And and, and one of the things that I didn't realize until I started, started doing this is to uh, learn that country songwriters actually write two or three songs per day, right? So uh, uh, if you uh, go, go at it for two or three decades, you have a catalog of, of roughly uh, 10,000 or more songs, right? So uh, it, it really is a craft in the sense of it being something that is done repetitiously, uh, 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 that, that, that requires its own tools, that requires practice and practice and practice, that, uh, that, that uh, requires learning on the hands of people who are more experienced at it than, uh, than you do. Uh, but essentially, and in the essence, a good country song is, uh, uh, is something that if you listen to it, you, you, you kind of uh, 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 share in the emotions of the, so of the person who has written it and the person who sings it, who's, who's cut the song, so to speak. Uh, but most importantly, you, you, you relate to the emotions of the person who wrote it. And, and if that is done masterfully, then it's a, uh, it's a joy to behold, even if you uh, are not necessarily uh, 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 prone to listen to boom chaka boom music all the time. Uh, Eckstein. I think talking about country music, what for me was fascinating is I watched Dolly Parton's life story documentary yeah. a while a while back. That biopic, yeah. and 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 so that so, so that the focus she brought to it, and to extend her identity being woven into not just her music but her whole brand. And her purposefully keeping the brand accessible. I mean, she she doesn't say anything that would be considered highly controversial. No. And so she's very keenly, I would think, aware of her brand and of her identity. And so to, to make the transition, not just only of writing songs, but also then to record it, bring it out into the world and manage that whole process and make sure that you understand the whole process. And having and seeing how she went through that those learning phases, I just thought it was fascinating. I, I I always respected her, but I have a completely newfound respect for after seeing that documentary. If you just want to 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 learn the embellishment of what we just talked about, right, the idea of that you can just take your life experiences and uh, 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 and to a certain extent put them in a song, right? I mean, if you listen to Dolly Parton's "Code of Many Colors," right, which essentially. Uh, 
it's her story of how she uh, she was so poor as a kid that her mother could only make her uh, clothes made out of rags, right? I mean, she comes from a very uh, poor uh, uh, coal miner's daughter type background, right? I mean, uh, uh, like the Loretta Lynn's of this world. Uh, uh, but if you listen to a song like that, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, if you've never listened, dear listeners, to Code of Many Colors, just find her on Spotify, but do uh, uh, make sure that you have your hanky nearby because it is a... Uh, a truly gripping story and it's a it's the perfect uh, uh, example of how you can take a life experience and turn it into an authentic song i think it's also interesting to see how she explored sort of all the adjacent genres as well yeah you know and 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 finding that the sort of um, i mean when you hear a dolly parton song it is it's it's very recognizable and what i would say is that country music has always produced those people right so i think that uh, uh, many people would not see her as a country artist but she damn sure is she's one of us but if you look at an artist like taylor swift right i mean someone who's been a diehard country who's been in pop who's uh, uh, uh worked with electronic music producers but at the same time is also very much uh, uh the voice of her generation right where the the relational struggles and the life struggles that many millennials go through are, are perfectly voiced by by someone like taylor uh, uh, and that is also a country song, right? I mean, she doesn't have to sing about pickups and guitars and, uh, and stray dogs, even though there's plenty of songs where Taylor actually sings about those things. Uh, 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 but to narrate the voice of her, uh, of her generation and to make uh, everyone's insecurities, but also their vanities and sometimes their feelings for revenge very palpable. Uh, and if you manage to do that masterfully, then, uh, then, then that's the genre, right? I mean, that's what country music is all about. I think it's it's a very emotional genre in 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 the very connective. It, it's not. I, th I think that some of the a lot of the music we hear these days tends to be almost aspirational in a way, or um, filled with emotions that are not necessarily positive. Whereas for me, country music always feels like it takes that negative and it has a reflective nature instead of a vengeful nature to it. Up to a point, again, I, mean, I don't uh, have the yeah. 27 years of experience you have in listening to 40, 40, 47, uh, actually. Okay. Uh, 47, I, I, yeah. I, I, was, I was born with, uh, with, with the, 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 uh, John Denver was the soundtrack to my birth, right? I mean, uh, all right. Uh, yeah, but, uh, no, but uh, 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 all of that aside, right? I mean, I, I think that the real uh, um, uh, quality of, of of that type of craft work, right? I mean, the, the idea that you can uh, can 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 bring those authenticity uh, 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 to a song is especially the fact that I think that that is exemplary for for what many entrepreneurs in this day and age can and and need to do, right? And that is to take their own life experiences uh, uh, and turn them into a product that not only matters to them, but then also has the the potential, as we just talked about, to relate to audiences in ways that that that, that, that non-authentic entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who have not shared in those live experiences can never duplicate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, bringing that type of authenticity to an audience that is then willing to engage with it, uh, advertise it, uh, uh, and of course pay for it. Uh, uh, but I do think that that in our post-industrial world, that is the uh, the key to uh, to making sure that as an entrepreneur you thrive, uh, and also uh, not just financially, but also I think in a psychological sense, right? I think that that's also the the, the best guarantee that you will get fulfillment out of your venture, uh, uh, and and that is by uh, by by making sure that your your uh, your venture becomes a vessel for the expression of your own beliefs, values, and and and, and identity. I think it's a very good point to end on. Find your identity, find your leadership identity, find your foundation for your business and just live it because that will also get you through those tricky little hurdles that's going to come along the way. Well, I would like to say thank you, Percy, for a wonderful discussion. It's always lovely to talk to you and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. And um, again, thanks for your time. I uh, thank you, uh, Eckstein, and uh, uh, I would like to end on the, the, the note and in the expressed hope that there's a, a, a bottle of Mosul uh, Riesling that we can finish at some point together, uh, Eckstein. Take care. That to me sounds like an amazing idea. <laughs> Where do you draw the line between a product for your identity and a product for your necessity? I personally feel no connection where I fill up my car and I'm not planning on paying for an artisan crafted petrol. But I do choose my art. And I do that carefully. 
Perhaps it comes down to how many people see me and my connection to those people around me. And sometimes it's just what I feel I resonate with. I probably won't drink a wine from someone that I dislike. But someone like Schäfer Fröhlich in Germany, in the Rhine Valley, I absolutely adore not just the, the wine itself, but the winemaker. I remember reading The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying by Marie Kondo, where she says you should hold something you own and ask, does this spark joy as to whether or not to keep it? Maybe we should try a variation on that. Does this company, does this product, does this person spark joy in my life? And how can I get that? I wonder, what will we be attracted to or connected to if we select for joy, for those things that make us flourish, make us our better selves? Now go out there, be exponential and do something nice for someone else. You can find us on the web by going to podcast.exponentially.me. We will also find additional media resources and some amazing insights.